camera off. Yeah, I'll, t I'll test video. Yep, how's that? We've got you, thanks. Good, thanks. <laughs> Just a courtesy announcement that we are now live on the internet. Hi, Martha. Can we do a mic check, please? Morning, Dean. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good, thanks.
Hello, Ruth, can we do a mic check, please? You're muted. You are still on mute. Okay, all there right. There we go, there now I we've got you. Am. Good. Look, looks like your video is freezing a little bit. There we go, okay, now it seems to be working. Yeah, I might have to stop the video and turn it back on because it tends to freeze. Okay. Hey, Dave, this is Victor and Supervisor Chavez will be joining us shortly. Just want to do a mic check. Okay, thanks, Victor. Do you want to do a, um, a camera check too, just to make sure that's all framed and ready to go? Yes, sir. Oh, there you go. Can you can you see me? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Campbell, can we do a mic check, please? Uh, hello, how are you? Hello, we can hear you. Thanks very much. Doing well. Great. Hi, Kavitha, can we do a mic check, please? Yes, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Martha. Hi, Kavita. Hey, Jay. Hi, Jay. Just a courtesy announcement that we are now live on the internet. Hello, Ms. Morales, can we do a mic check, please? You're muted. Of course. Hi, this now, is now we've got you, thanks very much. Mr. Tran, can we do a mic check, please? Uh, hi, everybody, uh, we Tran. We can hear you, thank you. Sounds good. Hello, Mr. Conda. Can we do a mic check, please? Testing, one, two, three. We can hear you. Thanks very much. Good. Hello, Mr. Shell. Can we do a mic check, please? I was about to say good afternoon, but I guess it's still morning. Good morning. For another couple of minutes, yes. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Dewan. Can we do a mic check, please? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Hey, Dave, it's Amy. I'm logged in as Cindy. Can you change that for me? Sure. One moment. Thank you. Oh, Amy, where are you? I lost you on the window here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you.
Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see all of you um, and so many of you. Emma, it's good to see you too. Look at this guy. <laughs> you lost a tooth? Mm -hmm. Oh, yay. Got the tooth fairies coming. Well, I am so excited. And on that happy note, that is how we, how we get ready to change the world. Um, just as, a, a, as folks are coming on, um, I'm gonna just thank everyone for joining us. We're going to um, do a roll call vote. And, um, and part of the reason we're doing that, this is for those of you, I, actually, let me ask the clerk, are we roll calling for the whole group or are we roll calling for the um, voting members? Just for the voting members. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do the roll call, take public comment, and then I'm gonna explain um, more about um, why we're doing roll call the way we are. So if I could, I'm gonna uh, welcome all of you to the first hate crimes task force meeting. And I'm very, really truly honored to be here with all of you and with my um, dear friend and a, a really a leader on this issue locally, um, council member Maya Sparza, um, who's our, our, our ABLE co-chair. So with that, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. Thank I'm you, Madam Chair. Um, before I do roll call, I did want to um, have a courtesy announcement that we do have closed captioning available for this meeting. Um, if you click on the live transcript button on the bottom right corner of your screen, you can turn it on or off. And you can also turn on a full transcript of the meeting with that same button. Great, thank you. Okay, we'll do the roll call. Co-chair person Chavez. Here. Co-chair person Esparza. Here. Member Boyarski. Here. Member Zayner. Absent. Member Lori Smith. Here. Member O'Neill. Absent. Member Jeff Smith. Molly O'Neill's here. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you. And Martha Wolpanski for Jeff Smith. Thank you. Member Narion? Here. Member Ngo? Absent. Member uh, Tindall? Actually, is it no NGO? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm here. Sorry. Thank you. Present. Member Tindall? I'm here. Thank you. Member Dewan? Here. Member Armaline? Member Armaline absent. Member Apple. Member Apple absent. Member Yeager. Here. Thank you. I'm Member sorry, Nancy Appel, I'm here. Sorry about that. I Thank thought I was unmuted. I wasn't. Thank you. Um, Member Estramera. Present. Thank you. Member Elgenaidi. Present. Thank you. Member Conda. Present. Thank you, you have a quorum. Thank you very much. And um, I wanna just say a very um, warm welcome to everyone. And it really is an incredible opportunity to be here with this very esteemed uh, group of leaders from throughout our community. Um, by way of introduction to our work, uh, the co-chairs of the Hate Crime Task Force, Council Member Myra Esparza and I are gonna provide for you today a why we're here how this task force was formed, the purpose path forward decision-making process and our roles. And we're also gonna provide a brief overview for today's agenda. But I really didn't wanna to go too far into all of that without starting with the why. And I wanna to turn to council member uh, Maya Sparza, who really was um, the inspiration for pulling us together. Council member. Thank you, and I'll try to be brief. Um, so what I wanted to say is in July 2019, um, we had a lot of families out enjoying the sunshine, uh, rides, music, maybe trying garlic ice, ice cream for the first time at the Gilroy Garlic Festival. Um, but in a matter of seconds, racial hatred changed everything. 
where families were torn apart, communities were torn apart, and a community celebration was turned into a haunting reminder that we here in Silicon Valley are just as vulnerable to hate, hateful acts as we've seen in other places in the country, whether it be Charlottesville, El Paso, or even the US Capitol. And the driving force behind these acts of violence are white supremacy and racial hatred. This evil is what took Trevor Irby, 13-year-old Kayla Salazar, and my cousin, 16-year-old Stephen Romero, and wounded 17 others. So when we hear about these horrible tragedies, our hearts break. We see an outpouring of grief and public support, condemnation of those who really support and subscribe to those racist, violent ideologies. And so it's easy to grieve in those scenarios, and we all understand that, and it's easy to point a finger at a lone person with a gun and condemn that person. What is so much more challenging is understanding that it's not just a lone person with a gun. It's a culture of hatred. It's a culture that has spread, in my opinion, in the past four years, and it spreads further through inaction. This hatred doesn't just feed on fear and anger, it feeds on inaction. And so in many ways, those of us, especially in positions of privilege, the world in 2019 felt totally different. It felt more, uh, when this tragedy hit us in 2019, we were experiencing unprecedented growth. And now we're, we're, we're still in the global pandemic um, the worst economic crisis in nearly a century and the most social unrest since the 1960s. And so for many of us, the world has gone from a place that felt fundamentally secure to the one that feels insecure. And so why I brought that up is that for so many people, particularly in communities of color, faith, our LGBTQ communities, that old world never felt secure that fear, that anxiety, the unease that so many of us in positions of privilege feel now, that's what people have been feeling the whole time. And now folks are being pushed even further, enduring the worst public health and economic effects of this crisis, dying and contracting the virus at the highest rates. That's what's happening in our communities. And so we, we are not looking the other way in Silicon Valley. The man who took Stephen and Kayla and Trevor away from their families, he wanted to hurt people of color. But the painful truth is that the greatest harm is done through inaction. And there's no bringing back those that we lost, but if we really want to honor their memory, we take action and we address and uplift communities who have been targeted by racial hatred. And, and with that, I just wanted to stop and thank um, everyone here today and acknowledge the fact that with COVID and the rise in hate crimes against our Asian community, this task force is needed more than ever. And I wanted to thank Supervisor Cindy Chavez for her leadership and her tremendous partnership and thank everybody here on this meeting today for stepping up to this moment in time and stepping up to this challenging work. Thank you. Thank you, council member, and, and, and thank you for sharing that, what I know is very painful and appreciate that very, very much. Um, what I know today um, is gonna feel like you're getting a lot of information. So I just wanna apologize in advance to say, um, there's gonna be a lot of, of uh, talk uh, today and we're gonna really work hard to make sure that we can engage um, all of you. You're um, important leaders in the community and a number of you um, have just done, you know, dedicated your life to this life's work. And so we're really honored that all of you could uh, join us. I also just wanted to acknowledge that um, council member Esparza's uh, grief turned to a call for action. And I just think that's a, the most powerful thing really we can do is to act. If Reverend Moore some time ago was really raising the, the the issue um, in many, many different locations and really talking about how radicalization, um, crime and other um, 
uh, you know, uh, hate crimes and incidents of hate were occurring against our communities. And I also just wanted to say thank you to him for the, being an early warning for our community. Councilmember Esparza and her colleagues brought forward a memorandum in August 2019 seeking action to address hate crimes. Shortly after that, the Board of Supervisors also approved a referral that I brought forward in collaboration with Councilmember Esparza and both her memorandum from her and her colleagues and my referral are attached um, so that you can have that as a reference. Following both of our efforts, um, we hosted a series of strategy sessions with former Supervisor, uh, Supervisor Cortezi, Assemblymember Council Chu, Councilmember Esparza, and eventually a session that some of you participated in with diverse leaders from all sectors to share their recommendations, visions, and goals for a task force. We've incorporated those goals and visions into the draft work plan, which we're gonna discuss later. Throughout our time on this, um, this uh, work, uh, I'm sorry, task force, I know we're gonna learn a lot. And my hope is that we'll work toward zero tolerance for hate crimes in our county. With your leadership, I know we're gonna be able to recommend meaningful strategies to improve reporting, victim services, expand community awareness and education, and implementation of early prevention uh, models in schools. And though we strive to be inclusive as possible during this process, we may miss folks. And this is where you come in. We're really prepared to figure out how to reach deep into the community focus groups or, or other ways of bringing people together, even in this tough COVID time. So our intention is to continue working with you to reach deeper into the community and get people's thoughts and ideas. And our goal as a group, um, I'm hoping, is to lead with a shared vision and really to move forward with consensus. So let me talk a little bit about how you all were asked to be here today. We have approximately 35 advisory members from academia, faith-based institutions, government offices, and nonprofit organizations and community leaders uh, throughout uh, throughout all, um, our panel. And we've invited you uh, members to provide recommendations and input to help guide the task force and the county toward this zero tolerance work. Advisory members are welcome to um, participate in every meeting, speak on any item, engage just as if you were a voting member. And there may be occasion when there, we're called upon, uh, we're asking you if you could present on a particular topic. And you may wanna come to us and say, here's something I think you're missing and here's how I could participate. So I wanna thank you. And I just wanna say that the reason um, that we have a small group of voting members is because in order, because this is a Brown Acted body and we're gonna talk more about the Brown Act, it means it's a public body that's meeting in public. What that means is that in order for us to have quorum, we have to have a quorum, which means 50% plus one of the voting members. And our fear was that if we got to 35 voting members on any given day that we were ready to take action, we wouldn't be able to do that. We anticipate most of the actions we're taking are gonna be done by consensus. The exception to that will be um, you know, um, meeting minutes and the like. And so this is intended not to distinguish people one from another, only to make sure that we were able to meet the, um, the quorum standards for the Brown Act and didn't slow down the work of this body. So with that, um, we're gonna receive a presentation and training from the County Council on the Brown Act today. So this is like what we're gonna get accomplished today. And we're gonna get a presentation and training from the County Council on the Brown Act and the rules. We're gonna approve our bylaws and meeting schedule and discuss our annual work plan and um, dive into two um, items today. There are two presentations that are intended to lay the foundational knowledge and shared understanding of terminology and local trends. And I just wanna say, um, I think I speak for um, uh, council member uh, Esparza when I say that we're beginning a path together. You're gonna give us feedback. It's gonna evolve and change. I think the most important thing is that everybody's voice is heard 
and that as we come up with shared thoughts and ideas that we don't wait till the end of this task force to start implementing where we can move more quickly, where your organizations can move more quickly or either of ours. So we just want to say very much a very sincere welcome and a very sincere thank you to all of you for participating. So uh, with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move um, to our next item, and this is public comment. And I apologize, we, I got this a little out of order. Um, this is an opportunity for anybody in the public, not on the advisory committee or the, the, um, the voting members, but anybody from the public to speak to an item that is within the purview of this committee, but not on the agenda today. And I see no hands raised on that. So I'm gonna go then to item four on our agenda. And item four is to receive a report from County Council um, regarding the Brown Act. And I'm very grateful to Kavita, Assistant County Council, who's gonna give us um, the 411 or 101 on the Brown Act. Good afternoon, everybody. I have the pleasure of having a dual role on this body of both being a member and serving as counsel to the group. So in my council capacity, I will be doing a brief presentation on the Brown Act, California's open meeting law for the benefit of all on the group. I think many of you have served on um, these sorts of public bodies before, and so you'll be familiar with the basics of the Brown Act. I am right now setting myself a timer for 15 minutes to make sure that I don't go over that and hopefully that I come in under that. So, let's see. As far as the presentation, Jill, is that something you're able to put up or I'm supposed to put up? If you have it ready, you can go ahead and screen share, but I also have it here. I don't have it pulled up myself. Okay, one moment. Thank you very, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We can go on to the first slide. Okay, so high level overview of the purposes of the Brown Act. Again, this is California's open meeting law. The principles here are that decision making processes of all legislative bodies, meaning decision making bodies within local government, need to be conducted in public and open to public observation and scrutiny. The idea is being that when we are conducting the public's business, we do that under the eyes of the public, not with backroom decision making, not with um, pre-screening to ensure that the votes are there, but instead truly having those deliberations and conversations in the eye of the public. The idea is to balance two legitimate interests. One, the government's interest in having um, candid and confidential discussions and developing policy initiatives balancing that against the public's interest in free and open debate and of being kept informed of government's activity on its behalf. In addition to state law, the Brown Act, we also have in the county an open government ordinance in Division A-17 of the Ordinance Code, which confirms the county's commitment to upholding the Brown Act, the Public Records Act, and other transparency laws. Next slide, please. And the foundational rule under the Brown Act is that at any time, the majority of members of a legislative body shall not, outside of a public meeting setting, communicate in any way in order to discuss, deliberate, pre-decide, or take action on any item of business that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of that body. Again, those conversations should happen only at the public meeting and not outside of it. Next slide, please. The Brown Act applies to local agencies like the county, legislative bodies like a board of supervisors, a city council, or groups like this. Um, it covers all meetings of those bodies. And one important note is it also binds people who are elected or appointed to those bodies even before they assume office. Next slide. 
uh, so I got ahead of myself, on what is a legislative body under the Act? Again, the governing body of a local agency, like a Board of Supervisors, Board of Directors, or City Council. Any other local body that's created by state or federal statute. An example of that that many of you may be familiar with here is the Juvenile Justice Commission. Uh, any other commission or committee created by charter, ordinance, resolution, or formal action of the legislative body. This group is an example of that. Any standing committee of a legislative body, for example, the board's Public Safety and Justice Committee. And then certain temporary committees of legislative bodies that include members who are not on the parent body. These are all groups that are subject to the Brown Act. Next slide, please. So what is a meeting under the Brown Act? In other words, what are the kinds of um, gatherings we have where we know we need to com comply with Brown Act rules? Well, it's any gathering of a majority of members of a legislative body to hear or discuss, talk about, deliberate, or take action on any item within our subject matter of jurisdiction. Doesn't mean that there's any voting or action happening. Uh, any discussion is enough to trigger Brown Act requirements, whether that's receiving information on that subject matter, hearing proposals, discussing their views, thinking about how they may want to come out, all of that would be uh, subject to Brown Act requirements. Next slide, please. And just to draw a little more detail out on this, uh, meetings include face-to-face -face meetings, which of course we can't have right now, video teleconferencing, what we're doing at the moment, uh, as well as serial meetings. So the Brown Act does not permit to happen indirectly what it doesn't permit to happen directly. So just as we couldn't all get into a room together to deliberate about issues uh, under this group's jurisdiction on hate crimes issues in a conference room, we also can't do so via email uh, or texting. We can't use um, intermediaries to have a series of communications, meaning that I would say something to a staff person, they would then go talk to another member to elicit their views, then they would go to a third member to elicit their views and share views indirectly through that intermediary. All of that is prohibited by the Brown Act. So we'll need to be wary of that with respect to uh, email chains and reply all because that constitutes a, a communication or a meeting under the Brown Act. Moving on to the next slide, a little bit more about electronic communication. About four years ago, the California Supreme Court issued a very big decision in a um, case called City of San Jose versus Superior Court, in which the, the Supreme Court ruled that um, emails and text messages on a person's personal phone or personal email account, if they relate in some substantive way to the conduct of the public's business, they're still public records under the Public Records Act. So the context in that case was texting about um, subject matter of a legislative body during a meeting. And even if that's done on personal devices, as long as it's county business or city business, then it's, sub it's subject to the CPRA. Next slide. Um, an even newer uh, legal development, just as of last month, there is a new um, uh, legislative enactment that took effect, which says that uh, Members of a legislative body may use social media platforms like Facebook to provide information to the public, make announcements, that sort of thing, but they can't um, comment on one another's posts or have deliberations or discussions about the subject matter of the legislative group using social media. So that includes things like liking a substantive post made by a colleague, retweeting it, responding to it with some sort of emoji expressing their reaction. Um, these are, you know, all the digital equivalent of having conversations uh, outside the setting of the noticed meeting. So sort of a, a niche area, but one that in our modern times, we, the legislature felt the need to address. Now, the difference is, or the uh, one distinction is that on personal matters, like wishing a colleague happy birthday or commenting on a photo of their child, those aren't matters within the subject matter uh, jurisdiction of the group. So that's fine. This is really for, for business, official business. Okay, the next slide, please. Now, the Brown Act doesn't apply to conferences. If, if numerous members of a legislative body happen to attend the same conference or you know, a theater production or something like that, um, or a meeting of another local agency or a social occasion like a cocktail party, that's not going to be a Brown Act um, subject meeting unless 
the members talk about the legislative body's business among themselves at that conference or party or theater production. As long as you're there for other purposes and not, you know, specifically having deliberations or discussions, there's no Brown Act issue. But if you happen to be in the same place as, you know, a majority of other members of the group and you start talking about issues within the group's jurisdiction, then it becomes a Brown Act problem. Next slide, please. Um, another important area under the Brown Act is public participation. In order for the public to know that we're having these meetings and to you know, meet that requirement of allowing the public to see and participate in government business, there needs to be a properly noticed agenda. It needs to be posted in a location that's freely accessible to the public, as well as on the county's website. The meeting needs to be held in a location that's accessible to those with disabilities and other um, access concerns. We have to allow public comment at every Brown Act meeting. All of you will be familiar with this requirement before or during consideration of each agendized item. There's also a comment period as Supervisor Chavez just provided for non-agendized items at the beginning of the meeting. And we can't require members of the public to identify themselves in order to give comment, nor of course, is there any pre-screening based on point of view or whether someone is supportive or critical. Um, public comment is just an absolute right. Uh, moving on, a legislative body may not take any action or discuss any item that doesn't appear on the posted agenda. And this, again, is to further that purpose of um, allowing the public to have notice. If we start taking up items that weren't on the agenda, the public wouldn't have known that those were on the agenda and wouldn't have been able to, for example, take off work to be present in order to comment on the item. The limited exceptions to that are briefly responding to statements or questions that come up during public comment, asking clarifying questions, making brief announcements or reports on one's own activities, asking staff to report back on a particular issue that comes up, um, or asking staff to agendize a particular matter of business at a future meeting. Now that's different from, for example, making a decision on an item that comes up during public comment and wasn't agendized. That's what, that's what is not allowed. Um, continuing with the theme of public participation, every member of the public has the right to record and broadcast a Brown Act meeting with their own audio or video recorder or camera. And the legislative body can prohibit that activity only if it is essentially interfering with the conduct of the meeting. Next slide, please. As a corollary to the Brown Act, this is an area where the Brown Act and the Public Records Act intersect. Uh, all agendas of public meetings and any other writings that are distributed to a majority of members automatically become public records under the CPRA, unless there's some very specific exception like an attorney-client privileged memo. Any writing that's distributed during a public meeting by staff of the local agency or a member of this body needs to be made available for public inspection at the meeting. And that's why during normal non-COVID times in where meetings are held in the board chambers, there are tables in the back where those papers are provided so that any member of the public can get them if they so choose. If uh, a document is distributed by someone else, uh, like a member of the public brings written public comment, for example, well, we can't make that available during the meeting because county staff didn't know ahead of time that it was coming, but it needs to be made available as a public record immediately after the fact. All right, next slide, please. And this is the second to last slide. The public's ability to monitor votes. So in addition to allowing the public to fully participate and have adequate notice of meetings, the public also has a right to monitor the votes of all individual members for items that are uh, motioned and then voted upon. So the legislative body must publicly report the action taken, the yes or no on the item, as well as the vote or abstention on the action of each member. It's not sufficient to say, you know, three in favor and two opposed. The actual vote of each person needs to be recorded on those, those items on which we vote. Now, final slide, we always like to close with these heavy slides about penalties and remedies in any of these trainings that we provide. Um, so penalties and remedies under the Brown Act. The first is uh, there can be a challenge by any member of the public to invalidate an action. So to invalidate the approval of a contract or of an ordinance or other action that's voted upon by the body. Um, that person can make a demand to the agency to cure or correct the violation, at which point 
uh, the, our county would need to respond through the Office of the County Council. There can also be challenges brought to um, find that past action or practices violate the Brown Act, at which point there can be fines. Um, of course, adverse media attention, possible referral to grand jury for criminal prosecution are also um, possibilities. I think we have a, a county that is very ethical and very good on the Brown Act, so I'm, I am optimistic and confident that we will never get there. But that is, I think, my closing point. And unless there are any questions, that's all I have. Nita, thank you. And um, one thing I just wanted to give you to maybe just for clarity, and this is actually another um, issue relative to those of you who are voting and non-voting. The the um, the non the people who are voting, you can't have a majority of those voting members discussing any um, topic that is coming before this committee and getting shared, um, you know, having a shared opinion about it. But part of the other reason that the others of you are non-voting members is that it's going to give you and us the flexibility to do committee work with you that doesn't impact um, having quorum because there's a lot of work that we're going to need to do in the community. So I just wanted to draw that distinction that the voting members have to be careful about not um, having a majority of the voting members come to a conclusion, but a lot of the work that we're all going to be doing collectively and that you as advisory board members will be doing um, with us at, this gives you more flexibility. And because we knew we needed to do more community outreach, it's part of the reason we designed it in, in a way that we think um, will make, will become more clear as we move forward. Kavita, was I accurate? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks very much. Are there any questions from any of my um, uh, colleagues before we see if there are any public questions or comments? Anybody have questions or concerns about the Brown Act or anything you wanna ask? I have a question, um, Cindy. Uh, this is Maha Aljunaidi. I had a question about what constitutes um, a, an, an agenda. So there are a lot of handouts, a lot of references. Uh, would it include um, anything that's in those handouts or references? In other words, can I bring up something in a meeting that is in those handouts or would that, uh, would that be a problem? No, that would not be a problem. That's within the scope of each item being discussed, okay. anything that's in the attached material. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mahan. We? Hi. Uh, so I wanted to, I had two questions. The first is a clarifying point. So the Brown Act rules, uh, do they apply to the advisory members? Um, Kavita? They don't, no. Okay, all right, that's more to be sure uh, about that. Okay, and then two, um, are the agenda packets and materials available electronically? I just prefer to work electronically. Yes. Yes, and I'm happy to put the link in the chat right now because I have it open on my other screen. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions from my colleagues? Any members of the public who would like to speak? and seeing none. On this item, we don't need to take a vote or anything, but the one thing I was going to tell you, if you do know how to use your your hands, great. If you don't, just wave or do as Maha did, just jump in. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and I know there's a lot of us, so if you can use your hands, great, but if not, no worries. Um, all right, so with that, I'm going to go to our next item, and this is item five, and there's actually um, an action item here, and then, uh, you know, I want to see if we can get feedback from you. Um, I know you all received um, the task force bylaws this and the schedule for our meetings, for our main meetings, and then a draft work plan. The task force bylaws um, really allowed the board to establish the, um, uh, the task force, but just want to make sure that the bylaws look uh, good to you or if there are any concerns about them. And Kavita can answer questions about those. That, um, so that's attach, attachment and action A. Um, action B is approving that meeting schedule that's here. And then item C is really for us to take a look at the work plan. And we're not gonna vote on the work plan today. And the reason we're not is we gotta hear from you before we make anything uh, concrete. Uh, so with that, um, Kavita, I don't know if you wanted to just maybe touch a couple high points on the bylaws or if folks read them already. Maybe I'll just go and see if there are any questions on the bylaws. Maha? Uh, can we? So I don't know if I actually saw the bylaws. I saw a lot of the handouts, but I don't know if I actually saw the bylaws. It would really help if you could share your screen to show us what you're looking at, because uh, and also a lot of the content was repetitive in different handouts. 
And if there was any way to consolidate things so that we're not seeing them multiple times, it would really help. Yeah, thank you. That's good feedback. And I'll ask um, my my uh, staff, we can work on that. And also I'll take a look at what got sent to you because what you should have gotten was a packet of information with the agenda items uh, with the link in them. So we'll fix that right away. Um, on I'm the sorry, I didn't get one either. Oh, that's helpful, Sonia. We'll we'll get on that. Thank you. So with the bylaws, you know what I'm going to do, you guys, if, since you didn't have them, we're not going to we're not going to vote on those today because I people should see those before. Um, and then and that way, I think reading screens, it just makes me nauseous. So we'll send them out and let everybody look at it. And we'll re-agendize that. Um, I'm going to ask um, and maybe we'll just do the same thing with the, the meeting schedule as well. Did people get the meeting schedule? No. OK, so we'll we'll work on that. Um, so I'm assuming you also didn't get the work plan. No, we didn't get the packet at all. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. And so there isn't a way to say the chat for some reason, the way that this working. is set up. So just wanted to share that as well. So if she puts up the link, we can't yeah. see it. I, I also don't want to, I don't think it's, there's a ton of value in having a discussion on items you haven't read. So we're going to, we're going to skip number five, not take any action on that. I appreciate everybody's uh, flexibility on, uh, on that. And I know, and I'm going to ask too, if, um, I'm going to just, I'm going to go to, I'm going to ask the staff if you can keep it on gallery view. That way I can see people's uh, hands and, um, and our, 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 um, so the reason we aren't able to put things in the chat, the way we have this zoom set up per our, um, our, uh, board, uh, our clerk of the board is not to have a chat section. And uh, we'll, I, I, I know there's some really good reason for that, but we'll take a look at that as well. All right, so let me just say, I apologize that you didn't have all the materials you needed. What we'll do then is we're gonna go ahead to item six and item six and seven are presentations. And this is a time for us to, again, to level set and then be able to give some feedback and, and ask all the questions you, uh, you like. So um, item four is, uh, presentation from Professor, Professor Brian Levine. Uh, Professor Levine is a criminologist, civil rights attorney, professor of criminal justice, and director of the Center for Study of Hate and Extremism at the California State University, San Bernardino, where he specializes in analysis of hate crime, terrorism, and legal issues. The center is a nonpartisan research and policy center that examines the ways of bigotry, advocacy of extreme methods or terrorism, both domestically and internationally deny civil rights or human rights to people on the basis of race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or other relevant um, status characteristics. Professor Levine will talk to us about the current political climate and the brief history of hate crimes. I wanna thank Professor Levine for being with us today. As you can imagine, he's getting demands um, left and right. And so we very much appreciate him being here. So we'll turn it over to Professor Levine. Thank you, and it's Professor Levin for you home gamers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have not, I, I, I hope I haven't been replaced yet, but you know what, it, it, stranger things have happened in the last year. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. If we could go straight to the slides, do we have someone who's running the slides or they want me to do it? I can go ahead and share my screen, sir. One moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. We can move. We can move on past that title one. Everyone knows where we're at. Let's stay it here for a minute. This capital insurrection wasn't exactly a secret. This is what we told Congress uh, in a written statement that was put into the record in September. And as you can see, we talked about how there were bursts of hate crime, vile internet chatter, foreign interference, and there was also conflict around catalytic events, particularly political ones. And again, you can see militia organizing, polarization, QAnon, all that stuff which came back later and indeed, the administration promoting the idea of a fraudulent rigged election, it, it, it came to bear, unfortunately. And uh, we could go to the next slide. Can I go past there? 
we, we don't have the time for us to tell you how wonderful we are. All right, uh, let me, <laughs> let me, let me just, uh, but over 30 years of doing this, uh, either people are very tolerant or I've learned something. Anyway, uh, we saw in 2019, the third consecutive year of over 7,000 hate crimes. It was a 2.7% increase, even though we had a decline of over 400 agencies actually reporting. And you'll see there are uh, a majority of the cities in your county are reporting zero hate crimes or, or, or not reporting. But as you can see, we bottomed kind of around 2014, and then we're on a little ways up, but we're getting more violent. So if uh, these offenses are getting more violent, we could go on to the next screen. Look at that. That's FBI hate homicides. They've got some limitations, but look at that. That's a record since they've started keeping them, and that would be a record even without the El Paso massacre. 2020 was an interesting year. We did not have any mass killings, so extremist homicides have gone down significantly. Let's go on to another slide real quick. This shows, uh, and again, 2019 was similar, just person-directed crimes, hate crimes uh, are more common, but we don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna zip through that. We could go, there we go. We, we saw 2020 have uh, so, some interesting aspects. These are Black Lives Matter protests, and we saw about 100 car ramming incidents. Uh, according to our friends at Princeton, where we got this data, 95% um, were peaceful. So just wanted to, you know, kind of take a little snapshot of 2020 things that were going on. Let's take another one, another slide quick. Thank you. Uh, this shows the increase. If you look at the red folks, those are the white supremacists slash far right. And they have been going up every year since 17 um, until last year. 2020 was down for everything, but they were still the number one uh, lethal uh, set of extremist assailants. Uh, so we could uh, just move on. That's the red folks. You can see they, they, they've been number one for a while. What's another 2020 crazy thing? Millions of QAnon supporters. And uh, we see them in, in the uh, single digits up to around 10%. Uh, and when you have people who belong to uh, Kabbalistic and quasi and sometimes more than quasi anti-Semitic spins on conspiracies such as QAnon, which undergirding it uh, really looks like the protocols of the elders of Zion and blood libel kind of together. Um, that's a problem. Also, when you look at the percentage of people who say violence is acceptable to solve political disputes, that's in the double digits, but we don't have the time. Let's go on to the next slide. As you can see, again, similar to the uh, federal data, California um, bottomed in 2014. And we've been, uh, just as the, the country has been around 7,000, We've been around 1,000, but there have been some limitations with the data we've been getting. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that uh, in a little bit. We can just go to the next slide. This just divides out how the hate crimes in California uh, have, have been occurring uh, over the re recent decade. And, uh, and as you can see, race uh, continues to be the, the, the top, uh, but uh, sexual orientation and religion uh, are, are very close. Uh, we could move on to the next one. Really disturbing is the growth of aggravated assaults. Again, remember that prior slide we saw federally, uh, more person directed, and we're seeing an increase, like for instance, in Los Angeles, uh, 2020, aggravated assaults and simple assaults were almost the same. Uh, and there you go, uh, 2019. If we can move on to another one that just shows that these are getting more violent. Again, just su summing up white supremacists, far right, continue to di dominate a diversifying pool, but they're now an insurgency and they're reconfiguring post-capital. So we'll see a leaner and meaner uh, type of uh, organizational structure. We want to be careful of the expanding nature of targets that they see aggressively, which includes government officials, not only state and local, but public health, uh, for instance, and now uh, national folks and Republicans. Remember, even this uh, Boogaloo boy who uh, murdered two law enforcement, he had a plot to kidnap its children uh, of uh, 
public school officials in the Bay Area. Um, since 2008, we've seen election uh, uh, violence, political violence and hate crimes, as well as uh, rhetoric on the internet kind of spiked around these same catalytic times. And we saw that January 6th. 2020, generally hate crimes are down. There's, there's some, that's some good news. Um, uh, our friends from the ADL who do just marvelous work, they're coming out uh, with a report uh, later this year on anti-Semitic hate crimes. Our data is, is pretty definitive on this. Uh, Anti-Semitic hate homicides are down and anti-Semitic hate crimes are down by double digit percentages in New York and Los Angeles. Thank goodness, 2019 was a bad year. I wouldn't take a lot of solace in it though. Why? Because a lot of Jews are attacked at houses of worship. They've been closed uh, at particular businesses around certain holidays when, when they're gathering. And the two cities that have the uh, highest number of Jews in the United States, they were locked down kind of the longest, right? So, um, and, and, and that anti-Semitic rhetoric is still there and we're still seeing anti-Semitic um, uh, uh, animus uh, online. Words matter, we'll see some slides showing how hate crimes go up and down under a combination of catalytic events, but also the bully pulpit. So we're gonna have a change in that, as well as a change in extremist unfettered access to the more larger social media um, platforms. Again, 2019 was the worst year since FBI data was counted uh, since 92. Um, it also was the worst year uh, since 95 for domestic killings. Uh, but in, in, in uh, 2020, down. We count our stuff a little different than our friends at ADL. Uh, I think we're going to have uh, a little bit more on the hard left. Doesn't matter. Our, our trends are the same. Um, extremist homicides down because of the absence of mass killings and white supremacists far right continue to dominate. Uh, white supremacists far right global and interconnected. We just had some hearings this week. Um, if we could, uh, in, at Homeland Security Committee, among others, if we could just move to the next slide. This is what I wanted to show you. These boxes represent the worst months in each year. And look at this. The worst month in 2016 was November, election month. Worst month in 2017 was Charlottesville month. And I'll show you a slide that shows that hate crime events actually peaked after and around the president's very fine people statement, not right after the Charlottesville uh, um, uh, uh, riot and, and, and murder. Um, and then uh, you can also see October 2018, a conflictual uh, midterm election. And again, around all these events, we've seen extremist activity uh, either that could have resulted in uh, uh, killings or did. So a combination of an increase in internet invective, then we see an increase in hate crimes around these particular times. And indeed, uh, the day after election day was the worst day since uh, June 2003. And if you go back to uh, 2008, you can see again, the worst month was when it looked like President Obama was going to win the election the following month, and the second worst month when it looked like he was going to take the nomination the following month. Let's move on to a couple other slides so I can wrap things up soon. This is what I was telling you before, look at that. That shows you day by day clicks. November 9th, 2016, day after election. And, and that's why we saw how politics plays into this. Indeed, the worst day for hate crime in 2019 was the day that all the newspapers announced impeachment. Let's go to the other slide, Just to show, uh, show you about Charlottesville, I think, if we, if, if we can. Uh, yeah, now August 15th, August 15th uh, is really when we started seeing hate crimes peak for the month, not uh, around August 12th when we had Charlottesville. And August 15th was the time of the very fine people statement. Let's move on to the next slide. Now we're going to micro focus onto Santa Clara County. Uh, here are hate crime prosecutions. Um, and for its size, uh, out of the top six most populous counties, uh, Santa Clara prosecutes uh, fewer hate crimes generally, and also uh, uh, far fewer um, under hate crime statutes uh, compared to other places. The state average for uh, district attorney referrals 
that result in hate crime prosecutions is 58% uh, uh, in the last uh, last year, which was 2019, um, and it was 12 and a half percent. Now remember, there's there's annual overlap, right? So we went back and looked, and the pattern went went back uh, for quite some time. So so that's something uh, that that you might want to look at. Also, there's been some variation with regard to uh, your reporting. Let's go to the next slide. Here are your cities that haven't reported or reported zero hate crimes. Campbell, Gilroy, Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, Los Gatos, Milpitos, Monte Serrano, Morgan Hill, Mountain View, Santa Clara, and Saratoga. Uh, so uh, what is that, like 11 cities out of 15? Uh, also about extremist stuff, just thought this was interesting. There's actually one person uh, under indictment and, and or charge from Santa Clara County in connection to the Capitol insurrection. Uh, who has been reporting? Uh, well, there were 49 events. This is according to the California AG, 62 offenses and victims. Um, and uh, uh, we, we saw the Sheriff, five, Cupertino, one, Palo Alto, three. Uh, uh, San Jose had 33. Now we could go uh, and we see uh, the, the transit folks in Sunnyvale. Uh, we could go to the next slide. Oh, that's not supposed to be on its side. But in any event, um, on my version, it's not. But oh, well, hope springs eternal. Uh, this is preliminary data from San Jose, um, 89. And we can see anti-Asian. Now, remember, Santa Clara County, unlike a lot of counties in California, uh, which have uh, Latino pluralities, uh, Santa Clara County has an Asian plurality. Also, Santa Clara County is more likely to have foreign-born people uh, in a household and also people who speak uh, a language other than English uh, at home in that household. So this is, a, uh, this is preliminary, but it's a big jump over the previous year. We can take a look at the previous year. Uh, uh, 2020 shows 89. Let's look at the previous year. We could go to the next slide. Um, well, actually, this is this is uh, uh, okay. This is this is some other data. This is San Jose going back, uh, but uh, uh, the numbers that San Jose officially reported locally were higher than the 34. But nevertheless, 2020, uh, you're going to see an increase. But I think that may very well have something to do with improvements in efficiencies. We saw this almost uniformly in Texas cities about two years ago. They all went up from like single or, or low double digits into like the 20s and 30s, 40s and more. So, uh, but as you can see, um, this is a 20 year trend of San Jose uh, af after some really low numbers. And, and these are from mostly FBI. Uh, you can see we, we've had some, some increases. Um, I think that's actually good because it means we're catching more. I think that's all the slides. Can we see if there's anything else in the next one? That concludes the slide, sir. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. There, there's a lot going on. There's a bill currently before the legislature to create a commission on hate. I, uh, I've been working very hard on that. I hope uh, folks do. We're also willing to come up to Santa Clara County, my old law school stomping grounds, um, uh, particularly after the, uh, the pandemic stuff ends. If there's any way uh, that we can assist your county, uh, it's, it's, it's our pleasure and thank you so much for having me and also if I could thank the wonderful people on your board, many whose faces I recognize who are really the people who get things done. It's the people in the community that coordinate and get the data and work uh, on an interagency and intergroup basis to get this stuff done and doing it regularly is, is really an anchoring first step. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Levin. And um, I'll just say, uh, we'll make sure that the slides get out to everyone um, because I, you know, that was a little bit of a whirlwind. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to open it up for questions. And again, I'm gonna ask if folks can raise their their um, hands and, um, and then we'll take comments and questions from uh, any of the panelists and then we'll go to public comments. So if you're here from the public and you wanna 
um, give feedback, you know, this would be the time to raise your hand as well. So I'm going to start uh, with Maha, Maha, I'm sorry, and then uh, Raimundo, and then Michelle, and then Jay. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to point out uh, or highlight a couple of things that Brian um, that Brian said, which I think is really important for us. And that is the FBI data is not that uh, great because uh, the vast majority of the police departments around the country, and he pointed out specifically in Santa Clara County, are not reporting because they're not required to. I think nationally, it's something like only 12% of law enforcement agencies report hate crimes uh, to the FBI. Therefore, we absolutely have to have numbers, not just from other um, governmental agencies, but we also have to have them uh, from community organizations that receive the bulk of them. And I can tell you that, um, that we also have to look at um, yeah, the ratios between reported and unreported. Someone like myself who is recognized as a Muslim experiences hate incidences all the time. I don't have the time to report them to CARE, to the Council on American Islamic Relations. And so we also have to look at those ratios. And I think that it's probably uh, the same or, uh, or, or different for each of the communities. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics National Crime uh, Victimization Surveys, um, which has collected data on crimes motivated by hate since 2003, they, fought, they report 36 times the FBI reported data. Um, so there are some agencies that are doing a good job reporting uh, these things and they 36 times the FBI reported data. So while the FBI data is, um, is, is, um, is a, a good uh, measure, uh, we should consider it to be one of many that we look at to actually be able to gauge the actual hate crimes that are being committed. And then the third point I wanted to make is that many communities are not comfortable reporting to any government agency at all. Um, I can tell you that a lot of the immigrant communities, uh, like the Muslim American communities, um, are, are just, just don't do it. And they don't have longstanding relationships also with law enforcement agencies. So you'll see really high numbers for the Jewish community, for the Black community, but not so high for the Asian, the Latinx, uh, the Muslim, the Sikh, and so forth, uh, just because of um, you know lack of relationships or fears and concerns. So as we as as a task force, we really need to be um, taking all of these into account when we're looking at the data. Thank you, um, Raimundo. Yeah, I, I have to leave shortly, so I will take my responses offline, but I would like to ask several questions um, from the professor. One is, are white supremacy terrorist incidents recorded as hate crimes? Uh, I mentioned that because in Gilroy we had, um, in 2020, a couple of incidents where um, a professor from one of our local JC junior, junior colleges um, was uh, arrested for uh, being uh, having a cache of arms and weapons, and he was associated with the Boogaloo Boys. I'm pretty sure you've heard of that incident. Uh, the second was a bomb build. Uh, a, another gentleman in the same neighborhood was building bombs down the street. Um, and then going back to 2019 with the Garlic Festival, um, I'm kind of um, surprised that none of those three um, were um, categorized as hate crimes. I'm not sure if it's a separate category for those. Um, and then the other questions I have is, what about incidents in school of uh, racial bullying? Um, I have, you know, working with uh, young people in the community, I have, you know, heard thousands and thousands of reports of, of you know, kids being, you know, racially bullied by, um, you know, because of their, their skin color or because of um, their culture. Um, and then lastly, um, is, there, what, is there any way to, um, you know, hold um, uh, law enforcement accountable if they don't categorize, you know, hate crimes as hate crimes? Fantastic. I'm going to try and hit as many of those as I can remember. I feel like the plate spinner on the old Sullivan show, but only two people in the audience will know what the heck I'm talking about. Uh, the first thing is uh, uh, hate crime reporting as of now uh, is voluntary. Uh, there was a bill, uh, the No Hate Act, which uh, did not pass. It, it is in the process of being fiddled with and reintroduced uh, in this Congress, uh, hopefully making things, uh, making um, 
uh, hate crime data collection uh, and funding somewhat tied. We'll, we'll see uh, how that goes. With, re with regard to um, various extremist homicides, you know, uh, we sometimes have, like for instance, in Southern California, a father killed his son. Uh, it came out later that he did it because he was gay. Then we had an anti-gay homicide, but uh, it wasn't determined until into the investigation that it was. So the initial checkbox didn't say it. So this this kind of stuff happens uh, all the time. And yes, the uh, uh, the uh, I, I I I I followed what happened in in, in Gilroy as well. Um, what we're what we're seeing now, also by the way, are these cases such as you know Las Vegas and Dayton, Ohio, for instance, where the motive of the offender isn't as readily knowable. Uh, so 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 that's something. But yes, uh, as as Maha said, uh, we have really big issues with regard to hate crime data collection. Although BGS did find in their latest. Uh, not even a report, but their latest numbers, that for the first time, a majority of uh, victims do report it. But that does not apply to the communities that she so correctly brought up. You can't compare um, a community uh, that does not have certain obstacles, uh, such as uh, cultural, linguistic, or, or, or uh, oftentimes, for instance, look at the attacks that we're seeing against many in the Asian American community um, uh, uh, this year. They're against elderly people. And just let me take a second on that because we're coming out with a report real soon. San Jose saw a doubling of anti-Asian hate crimes from four to 10. And, and, and of course, what I think is most useful about these numbers and what the, what the criminologists will tell you is not that they represent the aggregate number of hate crimes, but what they do very well is uh, reflect trends and targeting right down to the day. And what we're able to do is back check, for instance, our friends at Stop AAPI Hate, for instance, or SPLC when they did the stuff after uh, the 16 elections. And we can find that those trends are correct. Why is that helpful? Because that helps us direct resources. So for instance, if we know there's a catalytic event and what we've been seeing over the last decade, uh, certainly you know, Jews have been the number one religious group and, and blacks have been the number one racial group, but we see this carousel of tidal waves taking place against other victim communities, as well as sometimes Jews as well. So in, in the mid decade, we saw a head and shoulders top uh, against uh, uh, Muslims and Arabs. And then that yielded uh, into Latinos and Jews. And this year it's uh, Asians, transgender uh, and, and, and black. Mo most, but not all the cities. Uh, Phoenix is up, LA is up, um, San Jose is up. But most of the cities um, are seeing declines this year. I wouldn't count on them necessarily holding because once these COVID restrictions end and stressed out people who are experiencing real pain are able to gather and rub elbows, I think you're going to see other things. But as far as the extremism question, um, uh, we're looking, I think, more as these bigger, more uh, notorious groups, splinter, loners, duos, and larger cells. I hope I answered most of his questions. There might've been a couple I missed. Email them to me, I'll get back to you. Yeah, right, we're, we're tracking all that. So I'm gonna go to Jay um, and then Reverend Sakamoto and then Hui and then Fawn. Hi, Professor, thank you. I had a question about the slide or the information from San Jose PD. And um, can you talk about were those hate incidents or not hate crimes? As this group is going to see when I make my presentation, there's a distinction between hate crimes, hate incidents, matters that are solved where there's an identified suspect. Those are the ones that come to the DA's office. Obviously cases that are merely reported but may not be solved are ones that go to law enforcement. And then there's the ones that none of us know about because they never get reported. So Professor Levin, there were an awful lot of numbers there from San Jose, I think 2019. Um, can you describe what that chart represents or what those numbers represent? To the, to the best of my knowledge, and we'll, and we'll double check, 
Uh, those represent hate crimes in the city of San Jose for 2020. And Jay, I can answer that question. Uh, Dave Tyndall, uh, acting chief of police for San Jose. So Great those team. are in fact hate crimes. We do track, like Jay said, uh, two different things. Uh, we went back several years ago and, and felt that the hate crime portion was not enough to, for us to look and really see what trends were. Uh, difference between a hate crime and a hate incident for us, obviously the crime portions, the specific crime, so let's say a battery. Uh, we actually also track hate incidents. So that may be something like hate speech or bullying or something like the gentleman from Gilroy said, something that occurs at a school. We also track that portion of it so that we can see, even if it does not rise to the level of a crime, uh, we can see these incidents and where they occur. So if I'm looking in 2020 for hate incidents, we actually went down in hate incidents. We had about 87 hate incidents itself, uh, which is down from the 116 in 2019. Oh, so those, uh, but our hate crimes so in 2020 incidents. are up. So, so I'm sorry, just so, we, so we're clarifying, those were incidents then? No, those were the ones you were reporting out on were actually crimes. The 89 uh, we were are, crimes, in fact? Yes. And okay, then we so also, then we, I just want to make sure that because you know I, I don't know I don't know if folks saw that movie with Rodney Dangerfield and they're talking about a Kurt Vonnegut book and he's in the back of the movie line he says no this is what it meant that's why it's so great having you here to the best of my knowledge what we showed on the screen and I just want to clarify because this is important those 89 reflected cognizable crimes to the best of your knowledge correct not not merely non-criminal incidents that is fact that, that's correct they're actual crimes Thank, thank you, Chief. And by the way, and let me laud him as well, because what often happens, and again, we saw this almost uniformly in Texas a couple of years ago. And if you look back at San Jose a few years ago, you know, for a city of that size, a top 10 city reporting 11 or 19, it looked kind of low. So when you're getting up to these numbers, that actually shows, I think, greater efficiencies. And it's something that we should congratulate the police department for doing and not putting a bumper sticker headline because, you know, uh, the headline could say San Jose has more hate crimes than Alabama because Alabama had zero in 2019. But I don't think it's because uh, Alabama is free of hate. I think it's because the San Jose PD is doing a better job. Thank you. And I, um, I, I want to just acknowledge that we have um, uh, Reverend Sakamoto, then we, uh, Tran, Fongno, and then Michelle, and then I'll come over. I saw Kathy raising her hand. Then we'll go to Kathy Wan. And then um, what I'm gonna recommend is we, we have one more presentation. So we, we have time, but we have one more presentation. And um, you know, and any, and we'll, we can bug uh, Brian to come back too, as we dive deeper in here, because I think we're gonna learn a lot uh, today and you know, may, may, may jar some thinking. Uh, all right, so Reverend Sakamoto. Hi, thank you. Uh, Jerry is fine. Uh, what I found interesting in the graphs uh, was a correlation between uh, the increase in hate, hate crimes and political events. And I think that's something that we can actually work with. And we are, you know, we have a lot of crimes and uh, we have a great uh, police department. We, you know, we certainly have criticism about how we engage communities. But I think politicians are also responsible and we need to hold accountable. And that's not, and it kind of wanders into the free speech part of it. But that correlation to me was very eye-opening. I mean, we kind of think about it in the last year and how that has generated uh, so much um, uh, problems. Uh, but I think to hold um, uh, people accountable for how they, um, what they say and how, what, that speech actually uh, causes. I think that relationship, at least in that, those graphs was very uh, informative for me. The numbers, the final numbers of all of these totals, uh, you know, you're seeing all these numbers. When you look at those numbers at the end of the graph, they haven't changed all that much. It's not to say that the changes don't represent the life and family of people who have struggled under these uh, terrible events. But if we are to address the causes of these, I think that becomes something that we need to work at. We need to keep our focus on where does this come from? Uh, how can we address these causes that result in these uh, terrible uh, actions? But I just kind of wanted that, that, that correlation between uh, rising numbers and 
political uh, events uh, really was uh, kind of important to me. Cindy, I just yeah. wanted to, sub to supplement that comment with one other comment, which has been left out also in the literature that you've provided, which is America's foreign policy, such as the bombing that happened, for example, yesterday in Syria against Iranian militias. Foreign policy, American foreign policy, directly leads to hate crimes against certain groups, such as Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. Um, our, you know, war in Iraq, uh, Yemen, uh, Syria, uh, you know, Iran, and so forth. And I bet you it's the same also for Mexicans and for Latin American countries, and it's the same for Asians. As it concerns our foreign policy towards China. That isn't in any of your literature, and I think it's incredibly important to um, to highlight that that this is uh, this is also a cause for hate crimes uh, against certain groups in the um, in the county. Thank you. Thank you. And then take two now. Oh, thank you, uh, uh, co-chair. Uh, I have a few clarifying questions about the data. Uh, the first is that uh, there was a lot of, uh, Professor, there was a lot of uh, mention of white supremacy and white supremacists. And in the data that you reported, uh, does that include any incidents where the perpetrator is not white or is it only focused on white supremacists? Um. I'm, I'm sorry. With, with re, I'm sorry. Were you talking about the white supremacist far right violence? Uh, well, you had, you had in one of your uh, slides you had uh, you had numbers that were stating or trying to report the number of hate crimes that were reported to the Department of Justice. Uh, we're wondering, uh, and I'm just wanted to understand if in those numbers uh, of hate crimes, if that focused only on you know on white supremacists where the perpetrators were white, or is that just- I, I, I just, I'm not sure which slide, I think you're talking about my extremist homicide slide, right? The yes. one with the red folks? Yeah, that, well, that's one of them. I think the, the, there was a, a, the summary slide too where you had a lot of numbers displayed about hate yeah, crimes. Yes, yeah, okay, got it. Let me, yeah, great question. The FBI stuff where you saw that upward slope, um, those are all hate homicides as enumerated by the FBI. And you want to hear something crazy? They didn't count El Paso as anti-Latino. They counted it like anti-ethnic other. So there, there, there's a lot of stuff in that stew, but it gives you an idea. But yes, we, we've seen um, homicides that have been committed uh, that have not been by uh, extremist homicides that were not exclusively by white supremacists. But what I will tell you is they've been the number one a uh, uh, set, white supremacist slash far right, 2018, 19, and 20. And they've been going up 17, 18, 19. 2020, because of the lockdowns. And here's the thing about hate crime, why it's a crazy year. The number one most common place for hate crimes are residences. But the next eight, nine, 10, whatever it is, are all public gathering spaces. And that's why I think you saw a big decline in anti-Semitic. So, uh, so uh, people get mad at me because they say, wait, you're, you're saying that people love Jews this year. No, I didn't say that. I'm just saying that the, everybody's locked uh, locked in their house, so they're not able to beat each other up as much. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Uh, good good fortunately. clarification. Appreciate that. And, and part of the reason why I asked is just because um, just anecdotally and just through my own experience, I've seen extremism creep into monolingual communities and, and, and kind of creep into uh, you know, like communities that would turn typically be the targets of it. Um, but, you know, I, and I assume it's because of the rhetoric from the prior administration, but it started seeping into monolingual and some immigrant communities as well. So I was curious about that. The other uh, question I had, and this is kind of related to what Chief Tyndall uh, reported here. What's the difference between crimes, reported crimes versus reported incidents? Great, great question. And to make it even worse, the FBI uses the term hate crime incidents and when they do that, they're referring to crimes. But human relations commissions, and many years ago, I was going to try to work at the Santa Clara County Human Relations Commission, and my dad got sick in the East Coast, so I had to divert. So it's just like a homecoming, seeing all these great folks here. And let me tell you, you have such, such great community folks and such brain power in Santa Clara County. If there's any county in the United States that can tackle this, it's, it's, it's SC County. Um, with with with, res, with respect to um, what we've been seeing lately, again, this carousel effect, right? So what's going to be interesting in this realignment year that we're in, who's going to be the target six months from now? Will, will, will QAnon 
uh, shake off a lot of loose cherries and then rebrand itself as the COVID and on? I don't know. But, but during times like this, when bigger groups splinter, we often see uh, these Caesar Sayoc types, the guy, the guy who's mailing bombs, or these, or these manifesto killers spring up along with these cells. And, that, and that's, what we're, that's what we're worried about. And we have seen uh, now violence from both, uh, fatal violence now, and we generally had not seen left-wing violence in many, many years result in fatalities. 2020 was a year that we did for the first time in some time. So I and, and we the next presentation is going to dive into the categorizations and um, and the, the importance of that I think is that again to level set so that as we think about solutions in our own community we understand the the terminology and the and the next steps but that's what Jay's going to do. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. so cr crimes then, uh, crimes are things that you can prosecute. Incidents are things that can be mean and offensive. Uh, but but they are not prosecutable like extremism or an actual hate offense. And sometimes you have things that kind of are on the borderline. If you if you put a sticker somewhere and it doesn't cause property damage, boy, I'm getting questions on on that all the time. One last thing though, our friends at Stop AAPI Hate, they're counting incidents. But what I think is so interesting, among those incidents, they're actually finding crimes. Indeed, nine percent are assaults and they have another five or six percent which are spitting which also is a type of assault so what i'm saying to you is when you're looking at those numbers we are going to have a really big number on anti-asian hate crime i don't know if it'll be a record in new york city it will be and we're seeing it in a lot of the cities on the coasts but when you're looking at the news our friends at stop aapi hate they're looking at a whole universe of incidents, some of which are crimes. FBI says hate crime incidents, they're referring to crimes. Sorry about confusing the world. Okay, no, no problem. But like I said, we're going to dive more into that. We, did you have other questions? No, actually, the, my third question was, like, hopefully if the understanding between the discrepancy between what we see from Stop AAPI hate and then from the, F, and the DOJ jurisdiction, but I think that question was answered. Thank you. And we'll let Jay tackle that too. Thanks very much. I'm going to go to Chief No, Michelle, and then Kathy, and then I'm going to go to the public. Boy, and this is our first meeting <laughs> because by the time you got to me, Cindy, I think all the comments by Brian Hui and Jay and, and Dave and Maha are things that I was going to talk about actually. And so I don't have much to say um, after all those uh, you know, speakers have said those things already, but I just want to add, I, I totally understand the sort of like the, the, the question of the confusion over hate crimes and, and hate incidents, because we in law enforcement, we deal with this quite often because oftentimes people call us and they get frustrated because we would tell them, yeah, it's a terrible thing this person said or may have done, but it's not a crime. So unfortunately, we cannot take any enforcement action. And that's a great level of frustration for a lot of people uh, when they have to experience this. Just like what Maha said earlier in the meeting that she's been a victim of some of these hate incidents and stuff like that. And so I'm glad to hear that, you know, our first conversation is about the distinction between a hate crime and a hate incident. And San Jose PD, uh, you, guys are, you guys are doing a great job in terms of, you know, collecting those data already. And uh, I think moving forward, one of the conversations we may have as a group is how do we get law enforcement agencies to do what San Jose PD is doing already? Because I think that you know we focus on hate crimes and that's the name of this task force, but I think all of us would agree that hate incidents at times can be a lot worse than hate crimes. Because when you talk about hate crime, you can hold somebody accountable by an arrest, by prosecution, but a hate incident equally damaging you know to to uh to our society but really there's no accountability and so that's the challenge and how do we address hate incidents that are equally dangerous as hate crime but there's no accountability because a person can get away with it and i think it grows into a bigger problem than uh, when somebody's arrested or prosecuted and so uh so i just want to add that so thank you thanks chief michelle um Thanks. This is my name is Michelle Mashburn. Uh, I wanted to bring up the silent hate crimes that happen, especially in the context of May 1st being the annual disability day of mourning for people with disabilities that were killed by their care provider or a family member. 
Um, and these things I think are, are woefully underreported and in part they're underreported because of stigma and other things. But I think Maha really tapped into this with her comments regarding you know, the microaggressions. And I think as a task force, we have to be aware that crime is the end reporting measure that we don't necessarily want to have. Um, you know, but so how do we deal with the microaggressions? How do we deal with the everyday ongoing attitudes that, that create that other category of an individual you know, whether it be a disability or something else, you know, and why does that data still not show up when it is a crime, but yet it's not necessarily recognized as a crime because people, one, if you're an oppressed group of people, you don't know how to frame things all the time, or you're having a trauma response that means, oh, I can't report this right now because, you know, I'm so, I'm curled in a ball on my bed or whatever, you know, and then, so how do we advance that and, you know, I think the, the deeper dive is really in Santa Clara County is how do we prevent Gilroy from happening? And that starts with bullying. It starts with anti, you know, the different incidents that happen. And I mean, I'm not sure what the data exists because everywhere I look for disability data, it's like it, it's silent, it's underreported. And I think that's the problem with all of these data sources, especially when we go federal, it's, you know, it's, it's not, to be accepted as a standard number. And I think the professor said this a couple of times, you know, is that reality of um, these are reports, they're not necessarily actual incidents and crime rates, you know, that go on because it's it's still a stigmatizing and hard thing to, to walk through. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'm gonna go to um, Kathy and then I'll go to Rabbi Aaron and then I'll come to the public. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm actually building on the, the comments of the last two speakers. I, I think that one of the um, shifts in frame, and I wanna ask um, Dr. Levin this, um, one of the shifts in frame I think that, that we need to make is to really look at um, victim and community-centered definitions um, of hate, right? And so we've got all these, we, we have the infrastructure to support all of the legal um, and, and uh, you know, enforcement types of definitions. But the community has a very different definition because of the very things that Michelle has said, as well as the frustrations, I think, that were expressed by um, Fan No. And so um, I'll just share a really quick story. It's like a two sentence story. I do not know one Asian American colleague at San Jose State um, who has not told their elderly parents not to go out walking, even in their own neighborhood, without anyone escorting, including my own. I have gray hair because I've let it go gray during COVID. I've stopped jogging outside by myself. I bring my children along or I bring my very large dog along because there have been attacks in San Leandro, which is right next to you know where, I, where my family lives and other places. And so there's an effect even from the few, when you see 89 hate crimes or you see even five, it has this sort of chilling effect and, and changes in, in behavior in large swaths of the community. And so the inspiration I draw from is the research that, that universities and other places have started doing on trans individuals. A lot of times, um, you know, as, well, as well as Native American individuals, because the, the population is so small or the incident numbers are so small, we tend to think that there's no way to study it. But I think that you can use case study, you can do focus groups, you can have um, you know, qualitative people canvas neighborhoods and, and have them tell you stories about what's happened, about you know, they can even talk about things that have happened to their own family, maybe not first person. That type of data is also really valuable because I think that will also drive creative solutions that might not be the ones that we're always looking to. And so I was wondering if Dr. Levin has any, you know, any, um, you know, information or, or experience in communities that have used a, a community-based approach to define hate, um, as well as uh, coming up with maybe bias response sort of supportive measures and other types of things to help neighbors organize, feel safe, those kind of things. Not vigilante groups, of course, but, you know, really educating people and empowering people from where they are, so. Wow, great. And one of the, and one of the reasons I'm so thrilled, Stop AAPI Hate just got a wonderful grant and they uh, for $1.4 million and they are reaching out to communities in 12 different languages. They're doing something, frankly, that the government should be doing, but we have to have these liaisons. What I, because we have limited time, what I would say is uh, look at our report not as a thing of saying, wow, you know, this place only reported three or four anti-Asian hate crimes. But what I'm saying to you is 
when we're starting to see anti-Asian hate crimes for the first time in years in some places, this tells you something. And then when you put it together with these complementary victimization surveys, which we have found to be uh, quite um, accurate with regard to trends and timing as well, it is an aid to, to, to localities to say, hey, we're having problems here. And one of the things that we found, it's not just the catalytic event, it is the rhetoric around it. And something that we saw, for instance, in Orange County, just before I left to come down here to do the talk here, uh, we had neighbors sitting guard outside a family's home who was being harassed by unknown teens since they, since they uh, uh, recently moved in. So there are things that communities can do, a lot of restorative stuff, Unfortunately, I don't have the time because of the, the limitations, but these things are crucial. And one of the things that Santa Clara County might want to consider is doing a climate survey. And part of that may include having your own self-reporting site uh, where if you don't trust the, you know, uh, the, the law enforcement agency in your particular place, you don't speak the language, or for some other reason you're afraid, there can be some kind of community liaison. Check out my article in Stanford Law and Policy Review last century called Bias Crimes, a Theoretical and Practical Overview. We'll send, we'll send that out. Thank you, uh, Professor. I'm going to go to uh, Rabbi Aaron, and then I'm going to go to Ruth, and then I'm going to stop us. I'm going to go to the public. We're going to move on to our next item. Um, I promise that we'll, we'll bother um, Dr. Levin to come back. And now that he's given us some homework, um, he will definitely be back to help us. Pass so, fail. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, Rabbi? Thank you, and I'll try to be very brief. I appreciate Professor Levin um, talking to us about how incidents are important, not only for their actual number, but for their prediction of increases in crime and so forth. Um, another aspect that we've experienced in the community this summer is a certain kind of harassment that seems intended to skirt that edge between incident and crime, almost as if people are aware of what they can get away with and pushing the envelope there. And I think as we talk later this afternoon about hate incidents and crimes, we need to understand that phenomena and understand that it goes on in our community. Thank you. Can you give an example, Mel uh, Melanie, of what you mean? Just one example? We've had individuals who um, taunt or precipitate or will come into people's faces to bring out a response that can't be viewed as a hate crime, but using language and using a, a certain type of harassment really are on the edge and almost they're inviting a response that will then allow them to be the victim rather than the people they're victimizing. Thank you. There are these groups called First Amendment auditors which try to you know, basically goat people into uh, aggression as well. What were they called, Brian? First Amendment auditors, like they'll go up to a house of worship and look like they're, you know, they're, they're stalking it or casing it, or they'll, or they'll go into people's faces and things like that. Uh, and we also have found even with neo-Nazis, they will, they will uh, instead of vandalizing, causing damage, they'll put a non-damaging you know, sticker on something. Mm -hmm. San Jose Thank State got hit. Yeah, that sounded from more familiar than I like. Uh, oh, identity, identity Europa uh, hit us, so yes. Yeah, thank you. They've changed their Ruth? name, American Identity Movement now, so. Huh. Ruth and then Pastor Williams. Yeah. Um, Thank you for your presentation. I wanted to ask whether you've looked at any of the data from the Ralph Act, which is our civil hate crimes, and it's enforced by the Department of Fair Employment and Housing. And I was wondering if um, people who may not feel comfortable going to the police maybe did file hate crimes um, at the DFEH, and uh, whether you've looked at any of that data or whether you think it's even relevant. I, I looked at it a while ago. It, it certainly would be relevant. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to task our associate director to take a look uh, at it right after we're, we're off this uh, this thing. Uh, unfortunately, we're working on this a uh, big anti Asian hate crime report, so that's uh, taking a little bit of our, our our resources right now. Thank you. 
Thanks, Ruth. Pastor Williams. Uh, good afternoon. Um, just noticing uh, we're such a tiny population, the African American population in San Jose, to have the highest number of incidents. And uh, there's a fine line between that crime and incident. And this happens daily in our community. We're called names and, and, and followed uh, and horrible things just happen. And sometimes it feels like in the African American community, oh, that's expected or it's old hat or, or, or that's just normal. Um, and so uh, just trying to understand uh, and if you're talking about reported crimes, there are hundreds, just even through our church, th th that are just not reported because it becomes so common uh, because of systemic racism in the history that we have in our nation uh, for African-American crimes just not to be, uh, so I, I would estimate that number to be way, way, way higher. And I sure would like to see maybe a bigger representative representation on this uh, advisory board from the African-American community. Thank you. And Pastor Williams, we're happy to work with you on that. And I'll go through our list of who we asked and uh, you can help me get them to come. Because <laughs> I always say yes to you. All right, so we're gonna go to our public speaker and then I'll come back to see if there are any other comments. Sonia, I see your hand, but I've had this person waiting for quite a while. So I'll go to the public speaker and then I'll come back to you, Sonia. We have one more presentation, and um, I do want to respect the the, the two o'clock timeline. So, don't leave because I think the last presentation layered on this one will help us to get ready for the next meeting. All right. Uh, if I could ask the clerk to call on our public speaker, Madam Chair, would you like the time for two minutes? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Irvish. Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, thank you very much to everybody and all the uh, council members uh, and all the representatives of the different uh, religious institute. I just wanted to mention about the, the constitution, the first amendment. The first amendment, the Congress has made that you know no law uh, that respecting the establishment of a religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, abiding the freedom of a speech. No matter what, what kind of a crime is, all the participants or the individual or the victims are required to follow the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and Fifth Amendment and allow the free speech on at least, you know, to explain themselves about what the situation is and what they have gone through. Because every victim and the other side, other party, they have a different opinion about that. Also, I wanted to emphasize on establishment of the AJR 29 local law enforcement bill for the California state to memorialize the legislature's support for the local law enforcement for the Hate Crime Prevention Act, which is also known as the Matthew Shepard Act and urge United, United States Congress, including the members of California delegation to pass as the law by the president of the United States to sign into a law. The legislation strengthens the federal, state, local governments to investigate and prosecute the hate crimes without, based on the race, ethnicity, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation. Also, there is a California bill, AB 300, which allows, which was introduced in 2020, which is allowed the existing law by the attorney general that agency dealing with the crimes and criminals maintain the record necessary to report the statistical data, report statistical data to the Department of Justice and attorney general on a regular basis. It is also to note here that that 116th Congress, which is now passing the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, which is introduced on the May 5th, 2020, the bill, this particular law, providing the COVID-19 hate crimes as a violent crime that is motivated by two things. That concludes our speakers. Thanks very much. Sonia? Thank you. I just wanted to also add on a few things. I appreciate Ms. Wong mentioning the American Indian Alaska Native community and um, Mr. Williams talking about there are times when we um, do not get identified as clearly as we would like because um, from a statistical standpoint, they consider us statistically insignificant. As alarming as that sounds, that's exactly what happens. So we don't show up as prevalently as um, other um, 
other races or ethnicities. And it's very disturbing to us. And uh, I also appreciate what Mr. Levin said about um, incidents versus crimes um, and the constant, um, constant pressure and feeling of fear that is placed on our communities that um, Mr. Williams shared with us earlier, because this is what is happening to our community members right now. Um, my staff was afraid to come into our office because we were, we were vandalized three times um, at our facility and our staff were afraid that, are they now going to be attacked just walking to our clinic and back to their vehicles? Are they going to be harassed on a regular basis? Is our events going to be targeted? We had to add extra security. So these don't rise to the crime level, but it does rise to the fear level. It puts us always on this extra uh, sense of urgency around what we need to be um, aware of in our surroundings. And so I appreciate all of you taking time today. And this is such a critical issue. But if you could remember that the numbers don't always show what's actually happening on the on the ground to us. Thank you. Thanks all. And thank you for those thoughtful questions. I wanted to say a very special thank you uh, uh, to Professor Levin and really appreciate um, him helping us get, get started in this conversation. So I don't know, if Professor, if you're gonna be able to stay with us, but I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, I'm gonna now, um, and, and also just to, to say for all of you, we're, we're taking notes to figure out how this fits into the to the um, work plan. It'll actually be updated before you all get it for our next meeting. Um, and uh, what, what I'll do now is I wanna turn it over to Jay Boriarski for our last item. Jay's gonna um, uh, dive into a little bit more of the definitions. And then again, I wanna make sure we can ask as many questions, get as much clarified as we can uh, prior to our next meeting. So Jay, may I turn it over to you? A hate crime is a crime against three. It's a crime against an individual. It's a crime against the community that that individual is a part of. And it's a crime against our country. Most crimes are crimes against a specific individual as hate crimes are. But hate crimes are also a crime against the community. When a Muslim person is attacked, it's not just against an individual, but the message is sent to all the other Muslims, you're not welcome here. So it's a crime for that reason. A hate crime is a crime in a third way. It's a crime against our country because our country was premised on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and equal protection and equal justice under law. And that's why hate crimes are so serious and so deserving of our commitment. I'm Jay Boyarski, I'm the chief assistant district attorney for Santa Clara County. I've been blessed to serve this county for 26 years and I'm DA Jeff Rosen's representative to this task force. Deputy District Attorney Erin West is also uh, attending this meeting and she is the office's hate crime uh, head deputy district attorney who handles the day-to-day -day, uh, hate crimes and the statistical reporting. I'm going to spend just a few minutes going over a PowerPoint which talks about definitions of hate crime, hate incident. And that's a subject that you could spend an entire semester on in law school studying. I'm gonna to try to do it in about seven minutes. Then I'm going to talk about some trends that we've been seeing here in Santa Clara County. Uh, then I would like to play a 56 minute video that I think a lot of you have seen that Jeff Rosen produced and put out about 10 months ago. And then on, end on a personal note, I hope to do that in about 10 minutes. Can everyone see this PowerPoint that I'm sharing? 
Yes. In order for there to be a hate crime, we need to have an unlawful action against the person or property of another. that was committed substantially because of, keep that in your minds, because of, the victim's actual or perceived race, color, religion, ancestry, national origin, disability, gender, or sexual orientation. There you have the legal elements and definition of a hate crime. A hate crime is the only crime, really, where prosecutors have to prove motive. People always want to know, wh why was the murder committed if it's a murder? What's the motive? But that's not an element that is necessary to prove or convict someone of murder. But in a hate crime, we need to show motive. That's the part of the because of. Why was the crime committed? Now, the bias must be a cause in fact of the offense. It doesn't need to be the only cause, but the bias must be the cause in fact of the offense, even if there's other causes that exist. Anger, it's a dispute over money, that's okay, but we, we have to have the bias present. When there are multiple motives in a crime, the prohibited bias, let's say it's anti-Semitism, must be a substantial factor, a substantial factor in bringing about the particular result. The bias does not need to be the main factor, but it must be more than an incidental motivation for the crime. We need not show that in the absence of the bias, the crime wouldn't have occurred. These are legal factors in deciding a hate crime. Regarding this first element, it must be more than an incidental motivation. Sometimes I give the example of two people who get involved in a fender bender, and it leads to a, an assault and battery. And then in the midst of the assault and battery, racial slurs are used. Depending on, we have to look at every case into, based on its own facts, but arguably in that hypothetical situation, we wouldn't have a hate crime might have a hate, a hate incident because racial epithets were used, but the assault and battery took place because of the previous fender bender, the car accident. Who are victims of hate crimes? Well, anyone, anyone, no matter what their race or ethnicity is, anyone can be a victim of a hate crime. Also, we see community centers, educational facilities, families, groups, individuals, meeting halls, places of worship, public agencies. It is not necessary that the victim be a member of the targeted group. This is interesting, and I, and I think this, this group understands this. It's just that the defendant thought the victim was a member of that group. And you know that we see this, unfortunately, with members of the Sikh community who are perceived to be Muslim or perceived to be terrorists, and they are targeted. We don't need to prove. It's not a defense for the defendant to say, aha, he was Sikh, so I'm not guilty of a hate crime because I was really trying to target Muslims. Here are some statistics from Santa Clara County. You can see that in 2020, we had 17 cases brought to our office by law enforcement and 14 of them were filed as hate crimes. Now, Aaron West is going to sit down with Captain Randy Schreifer soon. We're going to be go going over the statistics that Professor Levin talked about that Chief Tyndall mentioned, in, and it's uh, interesting for us to consider that when San Jose PD talks about having 89 hate crimes 
And then this statistic that I'm sharing with you shows that 17 were brought to our office for the whole county. Why the discrepancy there? We're gonna dig into that and that'll be some of the work of this task force. But I think probably the reason is the statistics that I'm sharing with you from the DA's office, that's where there is an identified suspect. And we do not review hate incidents unless it's to determine if it can be filed as a hate crime. So our numbers are always going to be smaller than you see with other numbers where people are talking about hate incidents. And I'm happy to answer follow-up questions in a, in a little bit. You can see the statistics over the previous few years. The number one hate crime charge is Penal Code Section 422.6. There it is on the screen. This is a misdemeanor hate crime, and it involves the use of force, threats, or the destruction of property to interfere with another person's exercise of their civil rights. And here you see the elements. Someone is interfering, threatening another person in whole or in part because of the perceived or true characteristics of the victim. Those are, that's a hate crime against a person. Hate crime against property, 420, Penal Code Section 422.6B, very similar, where the crime is defacing, damaging, or destroying property. Typically, this comes into play when we have uh, graffiti. There are other crimes on the books in the, in the hate crime category. For example, Penal Code Section 11411B makes it a misdemeanor to hang a noose if the person knows it to be a symbol representing a threat to life on the private property of another person for the purpose of terrorizing. Similarly, 11411A, swastika, very similar. I wanna share a, um, let, let me talk about some trends. I just went over some definitional aspects of hate crimes. In the, the last 11, I was gonna talk about 10, but I'll talk about 11 because we just received a hate crime from Mountain View Police Department uh, yesterday in our office where the victim was uh, Asian American. In the last 11 hate crimes that we filed in our office, which is about over the last year or so, four involved race, six involved nationality, and one involved sexual orientation. The six that involved nationality Three of them were anti-Latino. Two of them were anti-Asian. One of them was anti-Middle Eastern. For example, a woman in Palo Alto tells a victim to get out of the country and threatens him with a laptop. He is from the Middle East. Someone says, you should go back to your country and then spits on a Latino woman. An incident in a grocery store. If you are Vietnamese, I will kill you. An incident on a bus. Mexicans are dirty, combined with a battery. An altercation in a store. Defendant calls the victim a wet back and threatens to kill her. Those are the six that involve nationality. The four about race, the last four were all anti-African American. One started with an argument about smoking marijuana and then escalated with the defendant threatening the man with a cane. Another one was a man walking a dog. A woman attacked him and started using racial slurs. Another one, a victim was in a wheelchair and the defendant brandished a knife and used a slur against the person's nationality. Another one told a neighbor to go back to Africa and then mimed a noose. 
And finally, I mentioned that the one of the last 11 involved sexual orientation. It was a uh, couple that was at one of their mother's house and the defendant yelled homophobic slurs and made threats. So that shows you the trends that we're seeing. Now we know anecdotally about the increase in anti-Asian American hate incidents. There was an article in today's New York Times and we've been discussing at this meeting and, and I hope that we'll be discussing it in future meetings. Um, those are the 11 cases, those are the last 11 that we've seen here. And I'm very interested in discussing more about um, what I believe to be a disparity between the types of cases that eventually make its way to the DA's office versus those that don't, don't even make it to a police department or perhaps they make it into the media, but they don't end up being things that we can take action on. Can you all see that? Yes. Thank you. This is not a Chinese virus. This is not an Italian virus. Viruses do not have ethnicities, religion, sexuality, or gender. But our community does. And if you hurt or threaten someone because of those things, you'll have a lot more to worry about than COVID-19. When you attack a member of our community because of their ethnicity, the color of their skin, or where you think someone is from, then you have attacked us all. This is not a challenge. Thank you. Um, what I'd like to do, are there any questions that folks want to start with? Thanks, uh, Supervisor Chavez. I, sorry that the video started again. Can no you problem. all hear me? Yep. So mm -hmm. the last thing that I wanted to say is uh, I'm really heartened to see this, this group. I know so many of you and I have known many of you for decades. This is work that is what made me want to be a prosecutor. I grew up in a suburb of Los Angeles where I was one of four or five Jewish kids in a high school of over 2000. And I know the sting of bullying and persecution. And from a very early age, uh, I wanted to be a person that could help. And I was very offended by powerful people taking advantage of lesser people. And I found a home, a very meaningful home in this work with many of you and in my career as a prosecutor working with law enforcement. So I am so grateful that I'm able to do this with all of you. And the last thing I wanted to say is thank you so much to council member Esparza and to uh, my friend supervisor Cindy Chavez for bringing your leadership to this issue so that we can all work together to make the world, or at least our small part of it, a better place. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Are there any questions or comments from the panel about what you've just heard? Or, you I, know, I just have a quick question. If you know how many anti-Asian prosecutions there were the year before this one where you had two? Uh, I do, and I know that Erin West is here to assist me, and she's got the statistics handy, and so I can, I'm sure that Erin is scrambling. I don't want to give the wrong statistic out, so um, we'll see if we can get that answer to you, Brian, and we can certainly share it with you offline. Thank you. Uh, Maha? I just wanted to say that I was really moved by the PSA. Um, it actually uh, made me tear up. And um, and it sort of uh, and I really appreciate you, Jay, and I appreciate all the good work that you're 
um, department is um, is doing. We've worked together on a hate and a specific hate crime against um, against um, actually a Hindu family that were thought to be Muslim, and I thought that you handled it incredibly well and very thoughtfully as well. Um, but it, it, the PSA brings to mind something that I saw in the literature that we had to read for the for the meeting, which is um, public relation campaigns and PSAs like that need to make it out to the community. Um, and you you all recall the the, the TSA uh, tagline: "If you see something, say something." And I'm wondering whether we could deploy something like that <laughs> for hate crimes. And when people people may not want to be involved when they see a hate incident or a hate crime happening, but they can certainly report it. And so I'm really excited about talking about that aspect of the work that we're going to do. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, Maha. That 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 public service announcement is um, that was April. It seems like it was so long ago, but that was just a few weeks after shelter in place started. And as we all know, words matter. And when the president, the former president of the United States is referring to a global pandemic as a China virus, we are going to see the consequences to that in our neighborhood. It's a, it's a direct line. And so our county has the leadership and the resources to get together and work, work together. And that was our effort to counter hateful messaging and it went viral and, and it got it got good attention. So thank you, Maha. Thanks, Jay. Um, we and then I'm going to make a couple of next step um, observations. Um, and I'm just mindful that I've got you all for five more minutes and I have one uh, public speaker. So we. Thank you. I'll, I'll just cut down to one question. And uh, you mentioned before that you get reports uh, where there's nothing you can do about it because technically no crime has been committed. Is there any kind of referral system or is kind of support provided to the people who report incidents that cannot be prosecuted, um, but they can be referred to a place where they can get some more support? We always want people to, we don't want people trying to make the decision on their own. Is this merely a hate incident? Is it a hate crime? We want people to call 911 whenever they're in danger. And if the present threat isn't imminent, we want them to call the police. And I can defer to Chief No or Chief Tyndall. Uh, my understanding is consistent with what we do in the DA's office when that we refer people to other agencies and we keep track of the hate incidents. Well, I think I can answer that question. You know, when we do have a, a hate incident that doesn't rise to a level of crime, we we try to work with that individual uh, and come up with services that we're aware of within the county. Uh, to provide that person resources, uh, whether it's a, a county resource or, or a nonprofit uh, in our county. So the networking piece is really important and putting the information out about all these nonprofits and governmental agencies to our community members uh, is, is critical and for law, for law enforcement personnel also, because uh, we don't know all the resources that are out there. And I can say that, you know, Maha, when we had our hate, um, crime incident in Sunnyvale about two years ago, um, you know, we reached out to your organization and the Hindu Association here in our county uh, for assistance in terms of the coordination with, uh, with the victims, uh, the outreach that we had citywide and all that stuff. Um, and I think it's just, uh, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, if you, you know where the resources are to, to ask for help and that's important. So that's probably one of the things that we should focus on is how do we make um, these uh, resources available to our community members and then available to to all of us here who are in the business of helping people. So um, I'll, I'm going to, uh, Mikhail, I'm going to go to you and our public speaker. I just want to make a couple of observations before I do that, just as we come close to two o'clock. First, I I want to say a very sincere thank you uh, to everybody for participating. I, I pr particularly um, um, Jay and Brian for their really thoughtful uh, presentation, both presentations. Um, a couple of things that I that we're gonna we're gonna re um, send out to all of you the links for the PowerPoint presentations, the information that you didn't get. So if you got information before, Maha, I, I hear what you're saying. Just delete all that. We're going to send you one just packet of everything that was shown today. The one thing you will get again when we meet 
is anything that's going to be on the agenda, you'll get a, a link to that. So some material will be duplicative because you're going to have an opportunity to discuss it. But we'll just as a follow up to this, we'll get you that information. The other thing we'll send out to all of you as a reminder is everybody who's on this group so that if there's folks you want to have a conversation with, you know, not violating the Brown Act, that you're able to do that. Um, and one thing I just really want to um, emphasize with you, it would be really important to look at the work plan based on what we heard today. I've actually changed my mind. I'm sure Maya has been scribbling too to say, you know, here are some other things that we should look at. Um, and, and the other thing I would just say, if there are um, presentations or presenters that you're particularly interested in, um, when we send you out the email with all the package material, please send that back to us. That will be incredibly um, important for us to be able to uh, get from you, uh, again, as we're all thinking about the work plan. Um, so what, and I know some folks will have to leave, which is why I wanted to make sure I said that to everybody before you zipped off. I want to hear from uh, 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 Mikhail. I'm going to go to the public, and then Jessica, did you have something? Oh, housekeeping you item: If you could, as chair, order the date and time of the next meeting because the calendar was not approved, that would help us oh, out. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, um, our next meeting is going to be on Friday, March 26, from 12 to 3. It's going to have a, a component of that will have um, testimonials as part of it. That's why the meeting is longer. Um, than, than normal. So I just want to make sure that people put that on their calendars now, 12 to 3. It's a longer um, a longer meeting. All right. Thank you for that, uh, Mikhail. And then we'll go to our public speaker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'll be very brief. I only want to ask that we agendize um, a discussion about the definition of the topic. I think um, I've heard a lot of uh, interest in the distinction between crime and incident. And um, without making further comment now because of the limited time, um, I think that uh, a direct discussion about uh, the name uh, that we're using um, is going to be critical uh, in, in, in terms of how we address policy here. So I just ask Madam Chair that we place that on a future agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to go to our public speaker. I'm going to ask if folks could stay for that public speaker would be. I appreciate it. appreciate it. Our next speaker is Irvish. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You'll have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Sure. Thank you very much. We are in the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. What is important to understand that this country has given a lot to the immigrants. All the immigrants, they, are, they, are, they belong to different communities, whether that would be any religion, whether that's a Christian, there's a Muslim, there's Islam, there's a Hindu, there's a Buddhism, there's a Vietnamese, there's a Chinese, Asian. A lot of people around here, and if you look at the history of the religion, there's a lot of, there are a lot of you know, ways to consider the hate crimes associated with that. The hate crime you know, could be associated with the different motives. That could be a money, that could be a property, that could be a man, that could be a woman. But what is to look at is the human value. If they keep that the religion binds the human value with each other. If anybody sees the right set of a human value within each other, I don't think so that you know, the, any religion you know, would, would not allow such thing to prosper. The religion allows to establish the right set of a relationship between the people. It binds the relationship, it binds the love, it binds the emotions, it keeps the people together. But what about the, then looking at the other side, what about the people who are nostalgic, the extremists, who only understands to do the riots, only understands to do the crimes, only understands when the crime is being committed, what is that you know, that keeps them continue to do that? What is the motive behind that? The competitiveness is also a part of such thing. It is important to make sure that, you know, to introduce a new space development laws which identifies such kind of a criminal or the people who does the hate crimes and how do they con continue to conduct such thing and still you know, continue to, to live. And I, I request the County of Santa Clara to introduce that first in the nation. That concludes our speakers. 
thank you very much. And I appreciate all of you being with us. And Maya, any last words for the crew today? No, thanks everybody for being here. Looking forward to working together. Very excited, great feedback. Thanks everyone. Thank you all. Th thank, thank you, you well. and thanks to Ma Monique Vill Villarreal at the San Jose Police Department and her team who always helps us out. I hope the chief is listening to her and gives us a gives her a couple of days off because she always helps us out. <laughs> Everybody, make sure you wear your masks. Don't touch your face. Wash your hands. Be safe. Bye. Vaccinations. <laughs> Bye, thank guys. You. Thanks, Tom. The meeting has adjourned.